Welcome everyone, pleasure to be here. I'm gonna talk about why defaults rock and labels matter, query theory and choice architecture. So look at this image. Attention really is our scarcest resource. You can see either the candlestick or the two children looking at each other. You can switch back and forth, but you can't see them both at the same time because our attention is finite. Well, it turns out the same thing holds when we make decisions. Uh, we formalized this uh, in query theory with Eric Johnson and myself. Yes, the guy that you just heard from previously. Query theory holds that we make a decision by generating arguments for option A and for option B. By asking our previous body of experience, what's good about option A? What's good about option B? And we issue those two queries sequentially. Again, because we have finite attention, we can only do one thing at a time. Very importantly, order matters, the order in which we issue those queries. As you query your memory about what's good about option A, you temporarily inhibit arguments for all other options because they're response competitors. And so subsequently, they're not recalled as well. So the million dollar question in query theory really is, which choice options are considered first? And one important answer to that question are default options. So let's make an intertemporal decision here. You can either have the option on the left, and in the delay condition, we assign this to be the, the default. You get this amount right away, but if you want to, you can change to get more later. In contrast, in the acceleration condition, the, the later option is the default option. The future option is the default, and you can switch to the earlier one if you want to. Does it make a difference in choice? Yes, we know it makes a difference. George Lonstein showed this back in 1988. But now we repeated the experiment with those two conditions to see whether or not query theory, actually query theory processes lie at the base of this difference in impatience. Uh, and so we do this by giving people the choice and before they make the decision, we ask them to type out loud because it's an online study, what goes on in their mind as, as they think about the, the, the choice that they make the decision. And subsequently we can code those arguments that they gave in this case explicitly. Normally we think this happens implicitly and automatically, but we can code those arguments about whether or not they're randomly interspersed or do they in fact cluster like query theory predicts. And then we can count how many arguments are there for the first option that gets considered or the second option that gets considered. And so just if you look at the slides on the left-hand side, we replicate the result that people in the delay condition are more impatient. Lower bars means that you're more impatient. A dollar in a year's time is worth less here today. Uh, and then the question is, do query theories predict this? On the right, you see that indeed, uh, in, under the delay condition, when people are more impatient, they generate more arguments for the impatient option, for the immediate option, which is a default. Uh, and in fact, our clustering algorithm shows you that uh, now condition, the now choice is considered first uh, in the delay condition uh, and second in the acceleration condition. In other words, the default is considered first. And so the question is, if choice, if the order in which we order those queries, issue these queries makes a difference, maybe we can manipulate the order. So we can tell people in the delay condition to explicitly now first ar generate arguments for immediate consumption in the way they normally do in the natural order that we saw in the previous study, or we reverse the order in the unnatural order. And that should make a difference. The difference between delay and acceleration that we see in the natural order uh, should become smaller or perhaps even reverse in the unnatural order. And when you do that, uh, the results uh, basically show that under in the natural order condition, we replicate the previous results. People are more impatient when immediate consumption is a default option, but that difference becomes non-significant uh, and, and the unnatural order uh, generation. So the question is, can we put query theory uh, and the fact that uh, changing the, the default option might make a difference to work to help us reduce the status quo bias that we saw in so many situations, including in environmental decisions and, and, and mitigation of climate change, for example. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence you know, reviewed by Sunstein and Reich and in a couple of places that it makes a huge difference when green electricity generation is a default offered by utility companies. People are much more likely to go for it than when brown electricity power provision is a default. And one question we asked ourselves in our lab is can, can we put uh, changes in the default to the larger later benefit option also to work with professional decision makers? Uh, in this case, we looked at uh, infrastructure engineers and architects, uh, and we know that they oftentimes make their decisions about uh, how sustainable to be in their design 
with respect to rating systems. You might be familiar with LEADS. We worked with Envision, which applies to a broader range of infrastructure designs. And the current rating system, the software that asks people a, a long number of questions about the design, basically uses industry standards, uh, industry current practice as the implicit uh, default. And you can earn points by doing better than that. We changed the, the software. Uh, we gave people the conserving option uh, as, a, as the, uh, the, the default option. Uh, and then they would lose points if they wanted to be less ambitious. And we find that even with professional decision makers, engineered and doubt with the conserving level actually scored 24% higher on sustainability. So in other words, defaults make a huge difference. Now, what other answers are there to the million dollar question? What choice options are considered first? And one obviously also has to do with reading order. Uh, left to right for English speakers, and we know from political science that when you vary the position of candidates on, on the voting ballot, uh, top being considered first, to, top to bottom, it makes a significant uh, difference in who gets elected in, in, in many important elections, and we've seen those results. So let me sort of talk about get a third answer to this important question, which options are considered first. And that has to do with how surface attractive the options are. Uh, of course, that's why we have advertising to put shiny labels, you know, shiny images, beautiful, attractive uh, images next to the option that we want people to buy. Uh, but it might also work in different ways. And this gets us to the attractive label part, part of my title. Uh, here we gave people uh, a representative sample of Americans a choice between two airline tickets, uh, one just the, the ticket itself and one a ticket that included a carbon user fee. There were two pages of text that explained why it was priced the way it was and what the money was, would, would, would do. The only difference between respondents was whether the user fee was called a carbon tax or a carbon offset. Uh, and would that make a difference in the uptake? And just as before, people, before they made the decision, typed out loud what went through their mind as they made this decision, then decided. And uh, as you can see, when the uh, user fee is being called a carbon offset, it makes no difference uh, to our respondents who they are, Democrats, independents, and Republicans, on average, choose the inclusive option 62% of the time. But for the other half, for whom we use the name uh, carbon tax uh, for the user fee, uh, it doesn't make a difference for the Democrats, but for Republicans, the uptake goes down to 27%. And so the question is, can we explain uh, these uh, differences in, in, in choice uptake by query three processes? And I just want to show you a couple of lists of what people type uh, in before they make this decision. Here's one, here's another one. And again, we can basically code these arguments for, does it support uh, the inclusive option or the other option? And then we can count the number of arguments for the inclusive option, uh, for the forward-looking option. And we can also see whether or not these arguments are randomly interspersed for one or the other option, or whether they do cluster. And does the, does the clustering lead to a larger number of arguments for the first queried option? Uh, and in, 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 in fact, you know, and do these two uh, process measures then predict choice? And so the answer is yes. There is clustering, they're not randomly interspersed, and the clustering looks very much like the choice pattern, as does the number of arguments for the inclusive option. And yes, indeed, uh, you combine those two predictors and they predict the choice patterns in, in, in a mediation analysis. So again, it's a recipe for intervention. Make cha change uh, the attractiveness of the option that you want to have adopted. Uh, let me give you one more answer to the question, yet one more, uh, which choice options are considered first. Uh, and the answer to that question is options that fit our active goal or our current mood. And so here we have a study that I conducted with Jen Lerner, uh, where we looked at the, the question about whether people's mood, uh, being in a sad mood, for example, might change how they make an intertemporal decision. Now, Jen, uh, Jen had done research on sadness actually leading to greater consumption, at least in Western countries. When we feel sad, we have to fill the void. And we do that by going shopping. And if you want to go shopping, you need money now. So the question was, would uh, sad, as opposed to other mood states, change your interterminal choice, the, the type of uh, decisions that we saw at, at the beginning of my talk? Uh, and so the answer to that is yes. Remember, lower bars means that people are more impatient. And so people who were exposed uh, before their intertemporal choice was a sad study, uh, with a sad uh, story, uh, as opposed to a disgusting story. In fact, it's from movie clips. 
uh, or with a neutral movie clip. So people who were in fact in a sad state were much more impatient in their decisions. They were much likely to pick the immediate uh, option, money option. And again, query theory processes uh, supported that. They were much more likely to have impatient thoughts and the, the larger number of impatient thoughts as predicted by query theory uh, was caused by the immediate consumption option being queried in a, in a cluster, in the cluster coming first. So uh, let's summarize this. Uh, basically, this whirlwind tour of query theory showed you that query theory mechanisms underlie many of your favorite interventions in choice architecture. Uh, the, the, the process of uh, Query theory being focused on one option first uh, explains uh, how many of the prospect theory framing interventions work, including default effects and the endowment effect. Uh, they explain how surface appeal interventions work, uh, including attractive labels, and also how some emotional interventions work. And the basic idea for all of those is that they refocus initial attention on a different specific choice option. So under one condition, you focus first on one, and under the, the second condition, you focus on the, on, 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 on the other option. So whichever option gets considered first, gets the query theory bump, uh, and first queries don't uh, exhibit any inhibition, and so therefore more arguments, and the balance of evidence, the balance of arguments for one or the other option drives choice, uh, and hence you know, sort of the query theory mechanisms uh, in many situations completely mediate the differences that we see in choice. So thank you so much uh, for giving me so much uh, for, for your finite attention. Uh, and I think uh, we're, we're going back to Chris. Elke, thank you so much. Listen, some questions about that, about query theory. Um, I'm sure it's running through so many different strategists and planners' minds right now that to reassess the order in which choices are presented to people, and of course, context and even mood can make a difference. But if we ask about the order for a moment, when we see it in a monetary decision of the smaller now, larger later, something like a gift card makes clear sense. What about choices that are more intangible um, related to say climate change mitigation actions, things you want people to do that in the long term and in an aggregate might mitigate some of the effects of climate change? How do you use query theory for something like that? Well, I think the second example that I gave about the dirty word was a dirty world study was basically exactly you know, sort of targeted at that. And so I think we have to be very careful. Many, many situations, many decisions that have impact on climate change also have other benefits. You know, people talk about co-benefits. Uh, and so some, some solutions might actually also be good for your health. Uh, some solutions are good for your pocketbook, investing in energy efficiency, for example. So I think the idea would be to use whatever frame, whatever packaging of the option that actually is good for you and for society in the long run to make that as attractive as possible for the for the audience, for the person that you are, you are, you are attracting. And it's not going to be the same answer for everyone. So for some of them, it might make sense to talk about the public good. For others, it might make sense to talk about the, the, the pocketbook. And so I think you have to, but as long as you know that your goal is for the person to look at that option that you want to advance first, yeah, then the, the, the choice is up to you how to do that. Terrific. And are there other areas, there must be so many different areas for good that we could be doing this in, I mean, beyond consumerism. Um, how might that work when you think about a kind of loss aversion for something like health, meaning personal health, trying to convince somebody to vaccinate their child, for example? Mm -hmm. So it, it, one thing I didn't make very clear in, in, in my talk was that query theory actually predicts exactly the same phenomena that prospect theory does. Yeah? It basically just provides you with a lower level psychological process explanations about why prospect theory regularities actually work, work, work the way they do. Uh, and so uh, what, what that means is that sort of you can basically sort of use the same interventions that we've talked about before. And, but I think query theory unifies, you know, sort of uh, helps you understand why they work the way they do. Uh, and sometimes one kind of intervention, like a framing intervention, might, 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 might not be appropriate in a given context. But if you know that the underlying objective uh, is to sort of refocus people's attention on the option that they hopefully will choose down the road, uh, that gives you uh, 
some idea about what other interventions might work. So in the case of COVID, for example, you know, two, two speakers ago, uh, we talked about how to get people to wear masks. You know? uh, and, and, and for some people, it, that, that might be something that they do because they want to protect themselves. You know? uh, for other people, it might be something that they want to do to protect other people. But if you know, if you, and also getting back to your presentation about individual differences, if you know your target audience, yeah, then you can use that knowledge to think about yeah, which kind of labeling, which kind of frame, which kind of sort of core motivation can you bring to the table that they will look at that option that is in everybody's best interest first. And when you do that, to what degree is there any wiring of the individual that comes into play? Eric Johnson, of course, right before you, somebody I think you know, uh, was talking about testing us for big five personality, for locus of control, regulatory focus, and basically found nothing. How about that with query theory? Does it have greater or lesser impact depending on how I am wired as an individual? Well, it turns out that, for example, the intertemporal choice uh, scenario is being used now in lots of hospitals to, uh, for, for eating disorders. Uh, and, and, and so talking about individual differences, maybe in terms of getting out of the normal spectrum, but into clinical cases, uh, it turns out that you know, sort of self-control, we know from Walter Michel, self-control is a good thing. Yeah? If, you, if, you, if you're waiting for that second marshmallow, you know, the extra 20 minutes, uh, chances are you're going to be richer, you're going to be more happily married, you're going to have more education because self-control is good. But self-control can also go too far. And talking about wiring, you know, people that either have learned uh, in early childhood experience that sort of they need to exert self-control or they, you know, they might have a, a natural uh, individual difference to be more self-controlling. If you push it too far, uh, some in some situations, people never choose the later, larger later option. Yeah? Okay. Uh, and, and so, yes, I, I think there is a tendency to look at one or the other option, perhaps also as a, as a pre-existing pre pre individual differences, all other things being equal. That doesn't mean that some of these interventions we talked about to refocus your attention, just because you have this chronic tendency to latch on one than the other, it doesn't mean that these other situational interventions don't work. So a state versus a trait in that case. A state exactly. can over, overpower a trait. Overpower, yeah. Uh, so one last very quick question from Slido. A viewer has asked, what research question are you dying to tackle next? Well, one thing we're looking at is to what extent it's not so much related to query theories or maybe sort of somewhat we're looking at right now, partly because it's this beautiful natural experiment we're giving is what is the effect of, of, of people's experiences with COVID, you know, sort of on, on other social issues, like, for example, climate change concern. Uh, and uh, there, you know, sort of one hypothesis that I put forward in 2006 is a finite pool of worry. Uh, and I think the media have been concerned about that. Now, as we're all concerned about, you know, sort of bringing back our economy and, and keeping our uh, uh, parents from dying, uh, we might not be paying attention to climate change so much anymore. It turns out the answer to that actually is not quite so clear cut. You know, so we're, we're exploring, uh, so the interconnection of, of, of perceptions of risk across domains, uh, and also what we maybe can learn in one domain, you know, learning that early responding matters you know, and procrastination actually can have dramatic negative consequences. Is that something that people can carry over from the COVID coronavirus situation to, to climate change mitigation? Really great. Elke, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Weber, of course, is a professor of just about everything at Princeton, her <laughs> mashup of cross everything from energy and the environment and psychology and public affairs and a very deep and rich career. And thanks for sharing that with us today. Appreciate it. Real pleasure, Chris. Bye. Bye.